everyone. Is my mic on? Fabulous. It's good to be here in Chicago. Thanks very much to Jonathan, the Chicago Humanities Festival, for inviting me here to speak with you. I'm a native of the city. And it's always good to be back here. And it's great to be talking at a festival where the subject is stuff. What a fantastic concept. And I'd also like to thank uh, the festival for allowing me to bring some of my stuff, as Jonathan just mentioned. Um, we have a fabulous program this weekend. We've had a fair number of celebrities on this program. I've never been in a program with John Waters before. It's fabulous. Um, I'm not a celebrity. Um, I'm a college professor, which you can probably tell from looking at everything about me. Um, and my tenuous link to popular culture is I was born the same week that Sesame Street debuted on PBS. Um, yeah, go to Wikipedia. That was November of 1969. I love that show. Uh, I actually live in Brooklyn, which is where Sesame Street is ostensibly uh, set now. And my favorite character on Sesame Street is Oscar the Grouch. My students, they, they know this because they've been to my office, which is a little bit messy. Who is Oscar the Grouch? He lives in a garbage can, and he sings a song called I Love Trash. And like Oscar, I do love trash, although that might be a kind of weird thing to say. Maybe it's more accurate for me to say that I'm fascinated by trash. And really, all of my work relates to trash. It relates to how we've organized our society in the past. And as a historian, I'm really interested in that. It tells us a lot about what we're doing in the present. And it may show us where we're going in the future. My topic today is what we're throwing away. And I'd like to start that discussion with three questions that all relate to this one image. This can offers a lot of information about our society. First, it tells us that we're used to disposing of a lot of stuff every single day. This is a New York City street garbage can. It's paid for with taxpayer dollars. I live in New York now. And I'm very happy to have some of my money go to keeping these things on the street because these cans reduce the amount of discarded material that's on the street. I say reduce. I mean, if you look closely at this picture, you can see it does not eliminate that. But it does reduce it and, in fact, reduces it substantially from what it would have looked like 100 years ago when that stuff was littering the streets. The first question I have about this is, what are we throwing away? What can we see in this can? There's some food, and there's a lot of materials we use to contain food. Bags, cups, bottles, a couple of cans in there. Straws. These are made of a lot of very modern materials. PET plastic, polystyrene, paper stock, Aluminum, a little bit of steel. Disposing of these materials is second nature to us. And here I should say that disposal is a normal part of life. Not just human life, but life in general. I'd also like to apologize for those of you who've had brunch, because I'd like to talk about poop for a minute. <laughs> what is poop if not disposal of stuff? We eat food. We use the nutrients from that to keep all the systems of our bodies working, our brains, our skin, our hearts, our muscles. But we don't necessarily use everything in the poop. So then we excrete it every day if you're healthy, if you're not, see a doctor, and I'm not joking about that. It's very important. And over the last several million years, complex organisms, not just humans, but all of them, do excrete biological matter. In human society, we have developed extensive ways of managing this. First, we learned maybe we shouldn't get our drinking water from downstream of where we are pooping. And later, we developed incredible infrastructure in order to manage this in a comfortable and sanitary way so that we don't get little things like cholera. 
So if you leave this room and go down the hall, there are rooms we have designed that specifically allow us to excrete these natural wastes and flush them down a toilet, and they eventually go towards the re-engineered waterways of the Chicago metropolitan area, get processed in the world's largest wastewater treatment facility in Stickney, and then released into the environment. This is a way that we've been able to manage millions of people living, eating, and yes, pooping in the Chicago metropolitan area. That's an extension of what we were like as pre-industrial peoples. That is stuff that we throw away. That's most of not what I'm going to talk about here. This can is different. Well, it's mostly different. It's possible that some of those plastic bags have poop in them. It is. And actually, it's possible that this can may have poop that I have put in there because I have a dog. And it is seen as appropriate that when we have dogs, we collect the dog's waste and put them in here. Because uh, I don't know about you, but I've not been able to teach my dog how to use a toilet. Um, there are some YouTube videos that show otherwise that's fairly unusual. But the reason why this can exist isn't for our dogs. It's because we've started to dispose of other things, industrially produced goods. This brings me to my second question about this picture. Why do we throw this stuff away? I mean, every single thing that you can see here, we purchased, we traded money for Coca-Cola, for coffee, for takeout food. We have spent money on getting stuff to us, so why would we then just toss it away where we don't have it anymore? Why we don't want our stuff anymore has a couple of different reasons. A beer can that is empty no longer has utility. If you go to a store and you buy a beer, you open it, you drink it, it's giving you a little bit of a buzz, it may have cleared your thirst for a little bit, and then why would you keep the empty container? It smells a little bit, it takes up space. So we throw stuff away because we don't want it. That's not the only reason why we throw stuff away. Suppose you're diabetic. One of the things that you need is to inject insulin into your system so you can manage your blood sugar. Um, I have diabetics in my family, and so I've grown used to them using a hypodermic needle, injecting themselves with insulin, and then they go about their day they don't reuse the hypodermic needle. Doing so can expose you to diseases like hepatitis. And also just keeping the needle around the house is fairly unsafe because you can get stabbed. So there is material that we dispose of because we fear it, because it is a hazard. In many ways, that actually relates to the poop I talked about. We flush poop down the toilet because keeping it around can expose us to infectious diseases. So we remove materials because either we don't want them or we fear them. It's useless or even hazardous to us. Um, and the third question that I have that's inspired by this picture is, okay, we know we have some stuff, a lot of it's industrial, we don't want it, we fear it, so we want to send it away. What do we mean by away? And here is where I have to footnote my talk briefly. I am an academic, please forgive me. Uh, my mentor is a historian from Pittsburgh, actually he's from uh, Jersey City, New Jersey, as you could tell if you ever heard him, uh, but a man named Joel Tarr, who argues that one of the big things about modern society is we have a search for something he calls the ultimate sink a place we can dispose the stuff we don't want without consequence. We have a search for this. And one of the points is we have never gotten to that ultimate sink. We find ways of putting things away, but there are always consequences. So 
thinking about that, we can talk about this can, but we can also talk about this theater. Um, the staff has been very kind to give me a bottle of water. I don't know if you can tell, but I'm a little froggy. We had a huge rainstorm in New York last week, and middle of the week I lost my voice, and it's working okay right now, but the water's gonna help. And eventually I'll drink this plastic bottle of water up, and there are many things I could do with this bottle. I mean, I could just leave it on the podium for someone to pick up. That seems kind of rude. I could drop it on the floor here. That seems rude, too. We have, by the elevators, a couple of canisters, you may have noticed as you got off. And those are waste paper bins, much like this, a little more attractive than this. And this is the kind of place where you're supposed to put things like this water bottle. At some point later today, a staff member, a custodian, is gonna come along. She or he will have a plastic bag, empty the contents of that container into the bag, go along to other rooms and do the same thing with their canisters. Eventually the bag will be full, the custodian will put all of the collected discards into a dumpster, a large metal container specifically designed to contain wastes. Sometime in the future, I'm not sure exactly how often a week this happens, but a truck is going to come along that is specialized to handle this material. It looks like this, usually has two or four people working on it. And one of the great things about these trucks is you can put the contents of a dumpster into it and there's a hydraulic press in the truck that will crush it down so that it saves space and you can put more contents from more dumpsters in it. Where do these trucks go? Well, in a city like Chicago, they can go to a material transfer station where they can be collected in even larger piles of waste and then transported by larger trucks to their final destination. Or these trucks themselves may go to that final destination. That sounds so ominous, final destination, the, the graveyard for our, our wastes. And in most of the United States, that final destination, that sink we have decided is the best possible sink, is the sanitary landfill. We've been using sanitary landfills for just about 80 years. Basically, these are large pits in the earth with a giant plastic liner, a little bit of infrastructure, some dirt, and we then pile our garbage into it because we figure that's the best way to deal with it. Um, in other societies, such as South Korea and Japan, they incinerate the vast majority of this garbage. We put it in landfills. This has a long history. Uh, I will not get into it too much, other than to say, in Chicago, we used to have landfilling in the city and the county. Um, first the city, and then more recently, the last seven years, Cook County have decided, we don't open new landfills here anymore. One of the reasons for this is that there has been a tendency in the United States to cite disposal of garbage, uh, so of hazardous wastes, in communities that are majority African American or Hispanic. These are not things that you want in your neighborhood. They may smell bad, they may bring insects, they may bring vermin, uh, they may bring tangible human health hazards. Um, if you're interested in that, uh, again, my book, Clean and White, talks about the long history of waste as it relates to racial identity and class in this country. Uh, and I'll just mention if you, oh, I've dropped some of my stuff. Um, if you are uh, cu curious about this in general, the modern environmental justice movement, a big part of that movement is the relationship of modern society to waste. So if we've got stuff in our cans from this building, it is likely going 20 or even 40 miles away to an exurban landfill, possibly in Lake County or Will County. So the trucks, that we have here to take our stuff away are spending a tremendous amount of gasoline getting our disposables away from this beautiful building and from downtown Chicago every single day. 
The system of throwing away is remarkably sophisticated. It's very efficient at handling many tons of discards. It generally keeps discards from piling up on our streets and in our communities, putting it far out of our sight and out of mind. It's not a perfect system. In addition to all that gasoline that I talked about, a landfill has a plastic liner, but it may tear, which might put the contents of it to leach into the groundwater. Organic materials in a landfill may break down, producing methane, which is a very powerful greenhouse gas that goes into the atmosphere. Combining that with the emissions from the trucks that I just mentioned, you've got some ecological concerns. Right now, as I'm speaking, there are a bunch of people hoping it's not raining too much this afternoon because they're marching in the People's Climate March. Our system of disposal contributes to the concerns that they are marching about. This is also a human health concern. The people on this truck are doing some of the most dangerous work in industrial society. Because what do we throw away? Things we no longer want and consider hazards. Might include food, might include old cans, might include rusty cans, broken glass. The hypodermic needles I mentioned earlier could be in the garbage. They're not supposed to be, but they could be. You never know what's in these cans if you're working on these trucks. That's part of the danger. And workers hauling and processing these discards not only face danger, this danger really isn't recognized very much. In popular culture, we think, yeah, garbage man, sanitary engineer, what's so special about that? Since we're in Chicago, I can't resist uh, talking about one of the dimensions of how this city has become a part of pop culture in the recent past. Dick Wolf, the guy behind Law & Order, has all these TV shows that are based in Chicago now. Chicago Hope, Chicago Fire, where he follows EMTs, cops, firefighters, and the drama of their daily lives, how they put their lives on the line and so much stuff can happen. I would love to see the show he has not developed yet, Chicago Streets and Sanitation. <laughs> There's so much drama in this, you have no idea if the next can you open could maim you or end your life. These workers have higher workplace injury and death rates than firefighters and police do. Yeah, this is that dangerous. And yet, there is no Dick Wolf show for them. So if there's anyone here from NBC, this is my pitch for a show. Give us Chicago Streets and Sanitation because it really would educate us a bit more about these unsung heroes that make sure our society works day in, day out, summer, fall, winter, spring. Because, you know, if they went on strike for a couple of weeks, we'd all notice. So waste removal has environmental concerns. It has human health concerns. And we do have some variations in how we throw things away. I did say that our dominant way of dealing with our disposables is to get stuff from our cans to these trucks to landfills. But we do commonly do things that don't involve landfills. This is a recycling symbol. Um, forgive me, uh, camera folks, but can I see a show of hands here? Who recycles in this room? Oh my, everyone just launched their hands up really quickly. Um, did you feel kind of obligated to do that? Did you feel like that if you didn't raise your hand, your neighbors would go, oh, what's wrong with her? How dare she not recycle? That is actually a big part of our society. We have been trained to recycle. I'm deliberately not defining what that means yet because we see that as a moral thing to do. It's a responsible thing to do, in part because we dispose of all this stuff. Recycling in the popular imagination is something that we developed end of the 1960s, beginning of the 70s, just about the time we developed Earth Day, which just happened, um, as a way to be more responsible 
about the damage we have been doing to the air, land, and water around us. And in many ways, the recycling systems that we have in 2017 are a response to that ecological, ecological concern of 50 years ago. But I'm a historian. We love to complicate things. Recycling has a much older and more complicated history than this. Paul Revere recycled 240 years ago. He did not do it because he cared about the environment. And in fact, if you told Paul Revere somehow, if you could get into a TARDIS or something and time travel back, yes, I put stuff out on the curb. Someone takes it away and goes, did they pay you for it? No, what are you doing? You're crazy. The reason Paul Revere recycled is he was a blacksmith. And in the 1770s, the British crown forbade the use of mining iron ore in the colonies to produce new steel in the colonies. That ore would have to go back to England and be turned into steel in Sheffield or Birmingham. So if you were going to work with metal before independence, you had to melt down old metal and turn it into the new goods. When Paul Revere rode his horses through Lexington yelling, the British are coming, his horses had shoes on that had been melted down from earlier forms of iron. Paul Revere recycled. After the United States won its independence, this continued, not because you couldn't use iron ore anymore, but because manufacturers in the early industrial era realized that some of the salvaged material was actually much easier to get and cheaper to get than harvesting virgin materials. So the railroads and the early steel industry tried to get scrap metal, or old iron, as it was called, in the 19th century. Paper mills would use, well, the stuff I'm wearing, once it was worn from clothing, to become paper for books. And this was the development of an industrial process that salvaged old goods to make new. Um, again, I've just given you a very brief history of this. I go into this in much more detail in the book, Cash for Your Trash, which covers the history from Paul Revere to the end of the 20th century. Um, the thousands of municipal collection programs in place across the United States depend upon this private industry. By 1917, the journalist George Manlove said that just the scrap iron and steel trade generated $1 billion in revenue alone in the United States. That was 100 years ago. This was big business. It remains big business. Um, today, though, we also have over 10,000 municipal collection and drop-off programs for recycling. And from this drop-off center that was on the west side of Chicago, it's not there anymore. This is a picture I took six years ago. Um, I don't know if you can read the fine print on this, but there are a lot of restrictions over which things you can put in the bin and which you can't. The reason for this is it's very difficult to collect things to recycle. If I am to recycle the paper that I've got from my notes, it's kind of tough to put this in the same bin as that water bottle or uh, old pizza box, because if water or grease or olive oil or tomato sauce gets on this, it degrades the material, making it harder to recycle. Uh, paper that was done like this, you can't turn into new office paper. You could turn it into toilet paper, um, but that may be worth less. That's probably the last poop joke I'm going to make, by the way. These kinds of um, municipal programs are the things that developed in the wake of the modern environmental movement because we felt rather self-conscious about our discards. Um, after World, well, World War II um, has its, an interesting dimension in the history of recycling in a couple ways. One is we had scrap drives so we could turn that old metal into planes, into armaments, into guns. So we had a lot of voluntary drives where like the Girl Scouts would come, they'd collect all this waste, and we done to help defeat Hitler. 
the war ended and recycling's, but it's a relationship to recycling still continued because one of the other things that happened in the war is we had to produce lots and lots of new stuff. Some of that stuff involved materials we weren't really using much before. Aluminum is an element, but to synthesize aluminum from bauxite takes a remarkable amount of energy. And so really until the 1930s when the United States, Soviet Union, Germany, developed vast new uh, ways to tap into electricity, including hydroelectric dams, we didn't generate enough power to mass produce aluminum from bauxite. But the war is there, we're building all these giant planes that can go further on the same tank of gas, and so we've developed a capacity to mass produce aluminum. That capacity doesn't go away after the war. Other thing that happens in World War II, uh, if you have tanks, if you have jeeps, if you have anything with a motor, you need rubber for the belts of the motor, also for tires. But after the early part of the war, when Japan controlled a lot of the South Pacific, the United States did not have access to rubber trees. So what does it do? The government works with industry to develop a vast research and development um, project to synthesize fake rubber from petroleum. This led to many new plastics developing during the war. After the war, we don't necessarily need the new plastics and the aluminum for our military production, but we've got the capacity to make them, so what do we do with them? We make beer cans, toys, packaging, all sorts of stuff from this new material. Um, and we sell it really cheaply, and we've designed things to be used once and then tossed away. Before the war, if you were gonna buy a beverage, maybe from a dairy, you'd get a big, thick glass bottle of milk. You'd use the milk, wash out the bottle, set it down outside your door, the milkman comes, he takes it back. You reuse the packaging. After the war, crack something open, milk comes in a paper stock and slightly plastic lined carton, you drink it, you crumple it, you put it in your garbage can. Single-use design becomes the norm in our society. And when single-use design becomes the norm, throwing more stuff away becomes the norm. And we did this. We put it in our trash cans, but we'd also be driving out and we'd toss beer can. Don't drink and drive. But one of, this is something that we also learned more in the 1960s and 1970s, but in addition to the issue of being driving while inebriated, one of the things that uh, people got irritated about was people throwing their containers out onto the side of the road. It led to a lot of complaints and eventually the Highway Beautification Act of 1965. So by the mid-1960s, the manufacturers of Coke, Coors, Budweiser, McDonald's Happy Meals, started to get a lot of scrutiny because they have all these logos on trash that is maybe blighting the environment. The beverage manufacturers especially were concerned about this, actually before the 1960s. In 1953, beverage manufacturers founded a trade group called Keep America Beautiful, which is kind of interesting because um, the word beer or cola or beverage doesn't appear in that at all. It's Keep America Beautiful. The title is about aesthetics. And Keep America Beautiful over the last 64 years has worked very hard and spent millions of dollars to train us. One of the ways it's trained us is to think about our own behavior. If you drink a beer and you toss it out, there's a name for you. Not a nice name. Litter bug. You're like an insect. Insects bring disease. They blight the environment. You are one of those people. How dare you throw this single-use container that we designed out? That's your fault. That's really Keep America Beautiful right there. So starting in the 1950s, there's putting billboards up. Again, I am a uh, child of the end of the 60s when I was watching Saturday morning TV. There were all these public service announcements about throwing garbage away, and there'd be a very sad man who is claimed to be a Native American, actually is Italian American, who you throw a hamburger down, you look up, one tear comes down his face. You have wrecked the environment if you wrecked this man's home. Don't be a litter bug. 
That's Keep America Beautiful. Keep America Beautiful continues to spend millions of dollars educating us, and this is their more recent campaign. I'm fascinated by this campaign because this isn't simply how dare you, don't be a litter bug. It's not even the campaign they were doing during the 1980s, which was putting signs up that kindergarten and first grade teachers could get, uh, put in their classrooms. As little kids are learning to read, they can go, oh, I want to save the earth. I know what I'll do, I'll recycle, because that saves the earth. Those are a lot of the posters. This is more aspirational. This poster tells a story. That big quote there is what that little can, that steel can, is saying. I want to be a bicycle. Recycle me. And this is one of the interesting things about recycling. Recycling can turn that can into another can. You can remake things into the next version of that thing. Recycling could also turn this paper into toilet paper. It's not as good. We call that downcycling. But if you turn a few dozen of those cans into this bicycle, that's upcycling. You've turned a single-use disposable product into something of durable worth, also of elevated worth. That bicycle should be worth a lot more than a couple dozen of these cans. Um, and you can use it to get around, and you might be able to use this bicycle for 10, 15, 20 years if you wanted to. That's the history of upcycling. And Keep America Beautiful has been very, very interested in upcycling. But the reason we have over 10,000 community pickup collections for recycling, in large part, is because Keep America Beautiful has trained us to do this. And so Chicago's taken a couple of cracks at recycling. One of the things Chicago did, if you were here in the 1990s, is we had this blue bag program where you were instructed to take some blue bags, put your metal, put your paper in there, put that next to your garbage, and they'd pick it up. That didn't work very well. Uh, so about eight years ago, they started putting these rigid blue bins uh, out that single family dwellings could use, and they've been gradually expanding that program, and so you can put your recyclables in those, and they get picked up by a truck. If you live in a high-rise in Chicago, uh, you're dependent upon private contractors recycling, and a lot of high-rises don't actually have recycling services, even though our local law is to do that. Um, by the way, if you live in one of those buildings and you don't have recycling, I'd like to plug one thing. There's a website called MyBuildingDoesn'tRecycle.com for the city of Chicago. Look for it on your search engine. If you don't have recycling in your building, that's how you can alert everyone the city, the Chicago Recycling Coalition, which I'm on just as a disclosure, uh, the Tribune and the Sun-Times and WBZ, everyone will know that your building does not recycle. Um, all right, quickly go on. So these recycling programs have been fairly effective at especially getting metals out of our landfills. The reason we recycle is we're diverting these materials from those mountains of garbage that are piling up, and we're turning them into new things. They've been very successful with aluminum. They've been very successful with steel. Aluminum, over two-thirds of all the aluminum we've produced in the 20th century is still being used in one way or the other. Plastics, paper, glass, it's trickier. Plastics, the, the national recycling rate for plastics, the diversion rate from landfills is roughly 15%. That's not much. So it's very likely that this bottle, no matter about my best intentions, is probably going to go to landfill. But it, you know, it doesn't have to. We found a lot of ways of upcycling plastics. Adidas, in the last couple of years, has uh, started a, a program where they take fishing nets from the ocean and they turn them into new athletic shoes that cost like $175. There are a variety of ways of turning plastics, hard plastics, into outdoor furniture. Patagonia has become famous for turning these bottles into polar fleeces. So there are ways of turning our discards into valuable goods. Thousands and thousands of valuable goods. Um, let's quickly go there. And so I have this book, Aluminum Upcycling, that's about the history of upcycling, because I realized, though, this is something 
We've really started talking about a lot in design, the design world over the last 10 years. It has a much longer history. And we've used aluminum to make uh, chairs like the Charles and Ray Eames made their aluminum group chairs starting in the late 1950s. For the last 60 years, those chairs have been produced largely with recycled aluminum. And today, if you go to Herman Miller or Emico, the website Design Within Reach, which sells this, you can spend $3,000 on a chair that looks like this. That's at least 75% recycled content. This is doing a great job of taking discards out of the waste stream and making them into covetable materials. So the book talks about furniture like this. It also talks about musical instruments. Uh, for a variety of reasons, manufacturers like Chicago Specimen Products, Travis Bean, the electrical guitar company, have made guitars that sell for between two and $8,000 out of aluminum often scrapped airplanes. Musicians such as Cheap Tricks, Tom Peterson and Rick Nielsen play these guitars, Dolly Parton's play these guitars, Shellac Steve Albini plays these guitars, and uh, I have to admit, I own two guitars from the Electrical Guitar Company because they're really great guitars and I covet them. Like these chairs, they're meant to be around for decades. They will outlive me as functional materials. And upcycling makes this possible. Also makes, uh, oh come on, the new Ford F-150 truck and the new Tesla cars use aluminum bodies. Ford invested in an over $1 billion recycling plant so they can uh, reclaim material and turn it into vehicles that will get better gas mileage. This is where our old aluminum goes. Pretty great, isn't it? Upcycling can make cool products that we'll use for a long time, and it takes it out of the waste stream. So our, have we solved our ecological problems? Well, no, we haven't. One of the problems is despite making these goods, we continue to design things for single-use disposal. Our disposal keeps going up in industrial society. We also have this kind of nettlesome thing. That Ford F-150, in the first year that Ford switched from steel to aluminum, they produced more aluminum-bodied vehicles than any vehicle manufacturer had in automotive history. Even though in the 1950s and 60s, Porsche, Aston Martin, a lot of sports car makers liked using aluminum. Our demand for these goods goes up, outstripping our ability to meet that demand with a secondary material. Between drinking more beer, using more cars, buying more chairs, and yes, even those guitars I like, we need more aluminum. Our production of primary aluminum around the world has more than tripled over the last 45 years, even though our recycling programs reclaim aluminum so effectively. Worldwide, when we throw aluminum away, we recover well over half of it. And in the United States and in Europe, we often recover over 75 to 80% of it. But even with that, we still need to get more virgin material. Our consumption requires us to continue to mine, to continue to smelt, to continue to degrade the environment so we can have more stuff. That's aluminum. Plastics, much more difficult. Most of the plastic that we use doesn't go to Patagonia, doesn't go to Adidas. If we're lucky, it goes to the landfill. If we're unlucky, it goes into our waterways and into fish and into birds and ultimately back to us. Sorry for hitting the mic there. Um, we are eating more plastic because we are throwing more plastic away. This is where our stuff is continuing to give us more of damage to both human and ecological health. So, these are the things I think about when I see a can like this. It's a fascinating example of how we've developed infrastructure to allow us to consume and to produce so much stuff. And it reminds us that even though these are very sophisticated systems, they come at a cost to the people who work putting the stuff in the right place and to what happens when that stuff goes to that place, be it a recycling center, be it a landfill, be it an incinerator. 
I thank the Chicago uh, Humanities Festival for inviting me to talk about this stuff, and I thank you for helping me by spending your Saturday here. Thanks very much. Uh, I appreciate the history. Uh, however, in the last four or five quarters, this increasing economic issue for the sorting companies, for the recycling companies, who cannot make money, mm. and many of them are planning to get out of business uh, or do something else. Uh, how do you think we should address this kind of issue? I'm talking about the difference from the can to the side bicycle. This is a great question about, especially since really 2008, there's been a decline in the value of, well, plastic is a problem, but even the metals. One of the important things to think about when we think of recycling as an industry is that this stuff is commodity, which means how much does it cost, what the market is willing to bear. And for a variety of reasons, the worldwide economy for metals has grown much more slack. One of the reasons is production of primary aluminum in China has really increased the last six, seven years. That's hurt recyclers a lot. Um, the other part of the question that was fairly important here is a number of recycling companies are getting out of the business. They're selling off. This has a very long history. Um, my great-grandfather did this stuff. The first thing he did when he came to this country as an immigrant from Vienna, uh, uh, fleeing repression, uh, anti-Semitic repression. He was in Iowa, and he collected materials there. Didn't stay in the business very long, uh, in part because the um, depression really destroyed the market for that. There have been a series of booms and busts for scrap materials really since the Industrial Revolution started. And if you look at the 1870s, the 1890s, the 1920s, 2008, 2009 to the present, you'll get a lot of especially smaller businesses getting out because they can no longer make money doing this. One of the things that happens is that a few successful brokers can buy up a lot of uh, smaller ones. And more recently, in the 21st century, there's a big Ontario firm called Phillips that bought a tremendous amount hundreds of firms, and then grew so large that they couldn't cover their debts and started selling off. So this is actually a very difficult business to stay in for long periods of time. That said, there are firms like Sims Metal, which handles about a third of Chicago's recycling, that have been in business for decades and are able to withstand these very brutal cycles to continue to do the work that recycles. Um, again, there's much more of this in the book, Cash for Your Trash, but it's not an easy business to get into, and I really respect those who can stay in it for a long period of time, because uh, there are people who li literally keep their phones by their beds to monitor the prices hour by hour of steel, not just in Chicago or New York, but in Singapore and in Tokyo. I hope that answered the question. I guess this is a two-parter, unrelated to unrelated questions. One is um, you hear a lot in Chicago, especially about um, vacated houses and how people get houses get stripped for the copper, mm -hmm. and all, I mean, so this recycling thing is in great like under underground demand, I guess. Um, they, black so, market, we can black, say it. Stolen market, stuff, yeah. Right. Um, so people aren't going to steal this copper unless somebody's going to buy it from them. So there must be a market for it. Um, so that's um, so this recycling thing has been going on for non-altruistic reasons, oh, yes. shall we say, for a long time. And I guess a question would be, you know, um, how that sort of plays out. And also, when you have a very old car that you want to trade in and it's not worth much, you say, we'll sell it for scrap. Mm -hmm. And so people are like, no one's going to buy this car, but all of the part, all the metal, all of everything will be recycled. So there's obviously a market for that. So as you're saying, this recycling thing has been going on for many years. Again, not because people are so environmentally conscious, but because there's a demand for this secondary, second hand 
metal products, I guess are kind of related because they're both really oh, secondhand yeah. metal, secondary use metal or whatever you want to call it. So those are just two things that came to my mind as far as how people have been recycling kind of under the radar for a long time. And I'm delighted you brought up both of these points because in an hour, I can't talk about much, but those are both very important parts of the history of this. Um, to the first question about stolen goods, anyone here read Charles Dickens' Oliver Twist? That's what this is about. Um, and in fact, the junk peddlers of the first couple decades of the 20th century were not seen as, yay, responsible recyclers. They were seen as moral menaces in society. That term, the moral menace to children, Jane Addams' direct quote from 1899. She wanted to get these people away from immigrant children so they'd go off, go into abandoned buildings, or maybe not abandoned buildings, cut the copper or the lead out of pipes and then sell them. And in some ways, this is, if you're a criminal, a brilliant thing to do because if you steal a car, there's a VIN number on the car. Now, there are ways of chopping it up where maybe you ignore that. But if you steal copper pipes, how are you gonna trace those, especially once it gets melted down to the commodity, the, the, the copper that you want? So that's been a long-standing issue. I will say this, though. In the state of Illinois, over the last decade, there has been a state law that means if I am selling copper or aluminum or anything to a scrapyard, there's videotape of me and there's a complete paperwork of what I have sold so that the cops can come and trace back stolen goods. This has been a problem over a century in the making. It's actually fairly well regulated in this state. Uh, but yeah, theft is a huge part of this. And again, my first book talks a lot about scrap theft and also fraud where you can lie about the weight of the material you've got. Depending on, you know, if you've got a St. Bernard, you can have the St. Bernard hop on the scale, then people have to pay you more for it. All sorts of really unethical stuff happening with scrap material markets, which then leads to a lot of nasty stereotypes about the people involved with that. And again, Oliver Twist, Fagan is not a sympathetic character. And it's not an accident, he's Jewish either. A lot of anti-Semitic stuff in there. Um, in terms of automobiles, Automobiles are great because there's a lot of steel on them. Um, and so if a car is not useful anymore, you can take like the transmission off, you can take the axles off, turn carburetors, those can be replaced and put on other cars. The steel though itself can be used to make all sorts of new things, including cars. It's tough to separate the steel from automobiles because there's a lot of different stuff like glass, leather, plastic. A uh, fuel tank, which might have vapors in it, could help you know, explode if you start taking it apart by hand. So it wasn't until the 19, late 1950s that we developed really cool machinery that you could put a car into it and a series of hammers and magnets would flatten it down. you get these shears to cut everything into ribbons. And in a matter of between 30 seconds and 10 minutes, you could separate the ferrous metal from everything else in the car and return that to production. By 1980, one third of all the recycled steel in the United States came from automobile shredders. It was awesome, it helped us recycle this stuff. Except automobiles were not designed to be disassembled that way. When you do this, you've got the metal and then you've got everything else, which could include lead in the paint, asbestos in the brake pads, which is what we did before the 1970s, and all sorts of other toxins that we're turning into this tiny particulate matter we can breathe or can get into the water. Automobile shredders, were regulated in the 1990s as Superfund sites because they were toxic waste generators. And a lot of the uh, producers said, hey, wait a minute, you're penalizing me for recycling even though Chrysler made this car this way? Isn't that hypocritical? And the judges went, yeah, Chrysler could do better, but you're where the pollution is actually happening. In response to that, uh, industrial ecologists and designers have tried to do things like design for disassembly. Can we pull a car apart without leading to these environmental problems? That's a big part of industrial concern today. How do we reduce toxins, not just in producing the goods that we use, but in their lives as used goods and in their disassembly and disposal? So thank you for allowing me to talk about that because your question gave me so much to talk about.
Oh, hi, Sherry. Hi, Carl. Um, I have a question. We just implemented the 7% of bank tax, plastic bank tax here in Chicago. Um, I know there's a <coughs> All right, let's talk about plastic bags, and we won't do this terribly long, because I, I do love the idea. Plastic bags, which are so much of this can, are useful, they're waterproof, you can put your dog poop in it, but oh my goodness, they're ecologically nightmares, and recycling centers hate plastic bags. We developed this infrastructure, includes lots of conveyor belts, these gum up the works. So if you talk to recyclers, they hate this stuff. And this is one of the reasons why, especially since the 21st century started, we've tried to reduce plastic bags. Um, and one of the very effective ways is what Chicago's been doing, which is don't ban the bags, tax them. Because who wants to spend another dime or another seven cents for this? When you can really bring your own bag, you could also get a paper bag, there's some debates, those are also ecologically questionable too. Um, but when the city of Washington, D.C. put a tax down for these bags, they did so in D.C. because they thought, okay, we'll take the revenue from that and that'll help us pay for the landfilling we have to do. And it turns out in Washington, D.C., that didn't work because in the first month, plastic bag use went down 80%. They didn't get revenues. They got rid of the problem, the plastic bags. Ireland, which is the country you're referring to, same thing. So taxes now, not just in American cities, but all around the world, are seen as ways of getting people to transition away from these single-use bags. So, and I, I do have to say, Chicago is usually not the cutting edge of recycling policy. I'm sorry to say that. So if it's happening in Chicago, you know it's already happened in Fort Worth, Cleveland, and many other places. So it's really comforting to see it happen in Chicago. I love my hometown, but in some things with waste disposal, we're not that great. So I was really happy to see the tax come here. This will be our last question. Oh. I'm too talkative with my answers. I apologize, everyone. Um, this is on uh, plastic. I saw the uh, environmental movie, The Plastic Ocean. Did you uh, see it? Yes. And um, it explained about, you know, it showed the cutting open of the animals and all the plastic inside of them and the fish eating it and everything, and then we eat the fish. And they showed how it, the, the plastic broke down to tiny, tiny particles, and then we eat it. But it didn't tell what it's doing to us. And I was wondering, do you know what it's doing to us? This is such a sad last question, yes. <laughs> um, it's a complicated answer, but bad things. There are endocrine disruptors in some of the plastics. First of all, I should say not all plastic is the same. Polyvinyl chloride is horrific and causes cancer. This PET stuff is relatively benign as plastic. Uh, one thing that Chicago actually did, not so much Chicago, but the state of Illinois did, before many places was, uh, there's these cleansers that have microbeads in them that can help you uh, de defoliate, and the plastic in there is actually not toxic until it gets in the waterways. And what happens? It's a magnet for various other toxins in the water. And so that stuff then gets eaten by fish that get mercury, that get um, PCBs that have attached themselves to the plastic in their flesh. Those small fish get eaten by bigger fish that eat maybe hundreds of those fish and get exponentially more toxins. We then eat those fish, and then we absorb the mercury, the PCBs, et cetera. Um, occasionally, you might see warnings about mercury in sushi or eating tuna. So don't have too much of this. It's not about this particular part of the world has a lot of coal-burning power plants that produce mercury. It's that the global oceans are full of this stuff and the plastic is transportation for it. So it doesn't matter where you fish that you will get toxins in your food supply. This has been magnified more over the last 40 years. It continues to mount. So we're polluting our food chain with the stuff we're using to contain our food. I apologize for bringing this bottle 
other than to say it's a really great educational tool about some of the dangers of this. Plastic is so convenient, it's so easy, it's so handy. If you ever spend time in a hospital, you will be grateful for plastic, for the things it allows doctors and nurses to do to treat us. But it comes at a price, and that price is the reason why I do what I do. Thanks for the question.